Good evening and welcome friends to this Spirit and Life Bible Study. My name is Jonathan. Our reader is Cara tonight. And our topic is Salvation is of the Lord. <coughs> Make sure the people on the phone are still here. Are you still here? <laughs> good. That worked out well. The, um, good. Yeah, okay. Salvation is of the Lord. Uh, there are, this is a quote from the Bible as it turns out. And um, there are two sort of views that I'm thinking about tonight uh, that I see as existing in our world of how we improve our situation or whatever. And one is the view that um, sort of the agnostic or atheistic view uh, widely held in Europe and so on that that uh, we save ourselves. In other words, that that if you want to improve your lot, get up in the morning, make a plan, make your make your life better. Um, that religion is a crutch. It's uh, you know it's something that weak people lean on if you can't solve your own problems. Uh, so that's that's one sort of view that we save ourselves, uh, which is not in accordance with this idea that salvation is of the Lord. And the other is uh, the the fairly widespread uh, Christian idea that we're saved by faith and that we can be saved instantaneously by our faith. In other words, all it takes is accepting Jesus as your personal Savior, getting baptized, and then you have salvation. And so people can tell you, this is the day that I was saved or, or, or born again. You know, it happened on this particular date. Uh, I don't think either of these views is quite correct, and this will, is what we'll be exploring tonight. Would you care to join me in an opening prayer? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are the living word made flesh. We pray for your presence among us, Lord God, through the agency of your word. Inspire us, Lord, to see your message there and what it is you would have us do for others. Amen. 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 Thank you all for coming. Very nice to see you. I'm thinking about my friends who are out there online and uh, sending you love as well, people who are watching and so on. There's quite a growing group. I don't know if you've noticed that our Facebook page has gone over 10,000 friends, which is nice. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, over 18,000 views of our Bible studies on, on Ustream and so on. So the Lord is, is uh, gradually growing that, which is a great pleasure. So uh, salvation is of the Lord. And what is the nature of salvation? Can you turn to the book of Jonah? Now, it's kind of tough to find. It's about two-thirds of the way through your book to the right. It's after Daniel and those. It's in the Minor Prophets and about halfway through the Minor Prophets. See if you can find Jonah in there. Because this is where this statement is made. In fact, it's the only place that these exact words occur in Scripture that salvation is of the Lord. Although there are a few other statements that are, that are similar here and there. And obviously there's a lot of things about this in in scripture. Uh, so let's look at Jonah chapter 2 uh, verse 9. Let's just read that in isolation first. <clears throat> but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. This is where our theme comes from for tonight. And what is Jonah's situation as he says this? Well let's look back at chapter 1. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and he asked him to go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Uh, as some of you heard me mention before, this is like going to your, your worst enemy and trying to save them. And uh, Jonah was not interested. What did Jonah do in verse 3 there of chapter 1? Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Mm. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And as far as we can tell, uh, some of these names have become somewhat obscure, but uh, as far as we know, Nineveh was to the um, east or maybe somewhat northeast from where Jonah was, and Tarshish was in Spain at the opposite <coughs> end of the Mediterranean. In other words, he went as far as he could possibly go away from the Lord. And it, took, it says twice in that one verse that he went to get away from the presence of the Lord. And then this great wind happened on the sea. And part of what I'm saying is that I think that Jonah uh, wanted to save 
himself. I think that's what he was trying to do. He felt that the Lord was taking him in a direction he didn't want to go in, and he wanted to save himself. And so he went as far as he could go in the opposite direction. A great wind comes up on the sea. You know the story, I'm sure, good friends. Jonah was fast asleep in the hold. They woke him up. They tried to do anything they could uh, not to have this outcome. But Jonah was clear that he was the fault. You know, he was at fault. And so he asked them to throw them into the sea. They tried as hard as they could to do anything other than throw him overboard, but it didn't work. And so finally they did throw him overboard. And the sea, in verse 15, ceased its raging. And uh, so in verse 17, the Lord prepared a great fish, you know the story, to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So let's read this prayer in chapter 2 then. Okay, so Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. Yes, and so where Jonah is, is that he's gone west. He was in a ship. The ship was very tempestuous. That wasn't working to be in the ship. They threw him out of the ship. Now he's in the water, which is even worse. And then he gets swallowed by a great fish, which is even worse. Worse. Uh, so he's in a terrible situation, and he's in the fish's belly. Go on. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly, uh, sorry, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. And you know that Sheol is this Hebrew term for hell, and the old King James says, out of the belly of hell I cried. Huh. So he was trying to protect himself, and he ended up in a place that he describes as the belly of hell. That's where he ended up. He ended up in a tempestuous situation and thrown overboard, and now he's isolated, and he's in the belly of this great fish, and his life is completely unmanageable, is it not? Go on. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. I think that's a very important moment where he decides, I've gone on the wrong track here. I'm going to look toward your holy temple. Go on. The waters surrounded me, even mm. to my soul. Even to his soul. You see, this is a spiritual experience he was going through, not just a physical one. The waters surrounded me, even to the soul. The deep closed around me. And my favorite detail... Weeds were wrapped around my head. Now that just clinches it for me. I, I love that, uh, that weeds are wrapped around, you know, like it isn't bad enough that you're in the belly of a fish <laughs> under the water with no <coughs> ship and no way to return, but weeds are annoyingly wrapped around your head. <laughs> Go on. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. Mm, I love that expression. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Wow. Yet forever, like he doesn't see any way out of his situation, right? Mm. Closed behind him forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Mm, the pit is a very interesting word there. And, uh, and has the Lord brought him up out of the pit? Where is he? In the belly of the whale. He's in the belly of the whale, in the belly of the great fish. Sounds and yet like he's saying, you have brought my life up from the pit. Hmm, go on. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, mm. and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. There it is again, the Lord's holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, oh. but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. <coughs> you know, these are not bad weeds around my head. It's actually rather pleasant down here. I haven't had any phone calls while I've been down here. Um, <laughs> No, he's managed to find a way to look at this positively, that he's going to be thankful to the Lord. He'll sacrifice him with a voice of thanksgiving. Go on. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. This is what makes me think that up until that point, he's been thinking maybe he could save himself or he could get himself out of this situation, that he, this job he doesn't want to do. And it's just become worse and worse and worse and worse. And then when he says, salvation is of the Lord, what is the very next thing that happens? So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. It may not have been a pleasant experience, but his situation was immediately resolved. As soon as he said, salvation is of the Lord, 
then he was saved. And the thing that he had already been thankful for actually happened for him in his physical life. He was, he, it vomited Jonah out on the dry land. Now, unfortunately, as you know, the Lord just said exactly the same thing to him. I would like you to go to Nineveh <laughs> and, and preach against it. And so he went this time. And there's more drama in the, in the book. It's a really great book. But um, salvation is of the Lord. He tried to save himself. He couldn't save himself. He realized in the belly of the whale that salvation was of the Lord. That seemed to be the point of the experience because as soon as he realized that, the situation resolved. As soon as he was thankful for an escape that he hadn't even experienced yet, then his situation was resolved. Uh, salvation is of the Lord. Let's look at some other passages, shall we, about, about salvation. Um, uh, let's go back to Exodus, the second book in to the left. And um, same passage we read last week. Uh, Exodus chapter 14. In fact, that whole story that we talked about last time, that your way is in the sea, is hanging around here still tonight. Uh, Exodus 14, verse 13. The children of Israel are on the, on the banks of the Red Sea and uh, terrified by the army coming in. And this is what Moses says. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today. Aha. Uh -huh. That's related, isn't it? Salvation is of the Lord here. See the salvation of the Lord. The Lord is going to save you. You can't save yourself from this situation. The Egyptian army is pressing in on you, but the Lord can save you. And he's going to show you his salvation today. Salvation is of the Lord. Look at verse 14. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Yes, that's right. And the Lord does rescue them. I've been thinking a lot this week that last Bible study really haunted me about uh, your ways in the sea and the idea that going through that sea was a purification process in which all the Egyptians that you don't want in your life were killed off and all the Israelites, I'm saying that in quote marks, you know, not literal people, uh, but what the text means is that elements in ourselves that we, what the Lord wants to purify us of get washed away in the water and, 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 uh, and then we come out purified on, on the other side. Uh, and that's the Lord's salvation. And look at, after it all works out and they get across the Red Sea, look at chapter 15 in the song that Moses and the children of Israel sing and look at verse 2 there. The Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. Oh, he's become your salvation. So he wasn't, hmm, it's like he wasn't your salvation before, but now that you're rescued, now that you're on the other side and the Egyptians have been handled, now he's become your salvation, right? Mm -hmm. Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. That seems like an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, oh, let's go, there's so many great things, but let's go to the Psalms right in the middle of the book, shall we? A few things in the Psalms I'd like to read in this regard. Psalm 3. What a wonderful psalm. Very related to that Jonah passage that we're thinking about. Let's read the entire psalm. Mm, okay. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Mm. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Mm. It Say reminds that. me of that storm that Jonah was in. Mm. Go on. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me. Ah. My glory. No, they, uh, so a shield. Hmm. You're a shield. We're going to hear some more about shields tonight. So, so remember that. Uh, the Lord is a shield. Okay, go on. Uh, you, O oh Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. Hmm. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Selah. And what a wonderful verse this next one is. I lay down and slept. Mm, that doesn't always happen in crisis mode, does it? I awoke, for the Lord sustained mm, me. That's so great. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. I will not be afraid. I will not, I, I might have been afraid, but I will not be afraid of tens of thousands of people. And that's a daunting thought. 
imagine being surrounded by tens of thousands of people. It would be like a ref in an NFL game announcing something <laughs> against the home team or something. You know, uh, not afraid of tens of thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Go on. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my Save God. Me. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Okay, it's very clear there that salvation is salvation from your enemies. It's salvation from the Egyptians, from people who are attacking you and so on. Mm -hmm. And that l last line there, belongs to the Lord, is very much like saying salvation is of the Lord. Right? It's a very similar uh, sort of realization there out of trouble and so on. Oh, let's go to uh, Psalm 18. Now, you see, some ideas about salvation, some mistaken ideas about salvation in Christianity have arisen because of the talk sometimes that salvation is like something you put on. Salvation is sometimes likened, we just saw the Lord likened to a shield. Sometimes salvation is compared to a shield. Sometimes it's compared to clothing, to a robe, sometimes to a helmet. Uh, and this has given people the idea that, oh, you can just put on salvation, you know, just like put it on in a second. Mm -hmm. And then, then you're done. Doesn't matter what you're like, you've got this nice helmet or this nice robe or this nice shield. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 35 there in Psalm 18. I think there's a truth to that and a falsity to it. It depends on how you hold it. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Uh -huh. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. Yes, that's wonderful. So you've given me the shield. Of, so the Lord's salvation is a shield. It's a kind of protection from evil. Uh, that's nice, isn't it? And uh, let's look next at Psalm 74. These are just little tidbits where we try to get an idea of what Scripture is talking about, about salvation. Psalm 74, verse uh, 12. For God is my king from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Aha. Uh -huh. I like that expression that he's working yeah. salvation. Right? It's not just sort of a, oh, quick thing. He's working salvation in the midst of the earth. That, that's a work that the Lord does. Mm. Mm. What does it say there in that next verse? You divided the sea by your strength. Oh, hmm. He's working salvation. and he divide, Oh, that's that Red Sea story again, right? Mm -hmm. it, you divided the sea by your strength. Go on. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. Yes, and it goes on with all this wonderful stuff about about all that. It's a little bit like Jonah, isn't it? Jonah was down in the bottom of the water and and uh, the Lord divided the sea by your feet. He's working salvation in the midst of the earth. It's a work. It's not just a simple thing. It's, it's a work that the Lord does. Okay, how does that fit with these other teachings? Uh, oh, back up there and look at Psalm 61. I've got these all out of order on my list. Psalm 61 verse... What? No, no, I've got the wrong one. Sorry. I'm, I'm really confused. The, uh, let's look at Psalm 116. That's what I want. 116. Turn to the right. 116, verse 13. This is a rather famous phrase, is it not? Mm. I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Yes, and it's right after that famous verse. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation. Huh. And look at what it says down in verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Hmm, weird. Mm -hmm. So there's a cup of salvation. Now I can't ever see the word cup in scripture without thinking about the Lord saying that he wanted the crucifixion to pass from him because it was a cup that he had to drink. Mm. The cup of salvation and the Lord working salvation in the midst of the earth. Is that really like an instantaneous thing? And precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints? You have to die to get this, this salvation or something? Uh, that doesn't sound like a quick thing that you do at the very beginning of your Christian life. That sounds like something much more involved to me. Uh, have a look at Psalm 132, if you would. 
Oh, let's look at verse 16. Interesting statement from the Lord. I will also clothe her priests with salvation. Oh, hmm. So salvation is a shield, it's also clothing. I'll clothe your priests with salvation. Hmm. Now see, the thought that this has given some people, I don't know if any of you have been in Glencairn Museum, I don't know if you've seen that, that huge painting uh, from you know, centuries ago to the right of the, all the mosaic and that big doorway uh, where it has uh, the, the figure of Jesus and he has this enormous cloak and everybody's under his cloak. Mm -hmm. And this is the cloak of his merit. And everybody's going to be saved because he wrapped them in the robe of his salvation. You know, they're going to they're get in because, they're, because he clothed them with his salvation. And so they didn't really have to do anything except, I believe in you, thank you, you know, and I'm sorry for everything. And Okay, boom, and they're in. They're, they're <laughs> under that robe. That's not exactly the, the view uh, that I see in, in Scripture about what's going on here. Oh, let's look at Isaiah. Let's turn to the right and jump into Isaiah. It's a few books to your right there. Uh, let's look at, uh, I don't know, Isaiah chapter 12. Mm. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 12, verses 2, clear through to the end of that chapter. Okay. <coughs> Behold, God is my salvation. Oh, yes. I will trust and not be afraid for Yah the Lord is my strength and song oh say it again and go on he also has become my salvation hey, wait a second that's quoting that song that's the same thing Moses is saying right mm -hmm. he's my strength and song and he's become my salvation oh there it is it's in Isaiah again okay and it says God is my salvation okay go on Therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. The wells of salvation. You'll draw water from the wells of salvation. What are those wells? You'll draw water from the wells of salvation. Is that something you do once and you're done? Or do you keep going back to that well? Is that a well that you keep going to? Go on. And in that day you will say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name. Declare his deeds among the peoples. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Mm. Cry out and shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. In your midst, the Lord is working salvation in the midst of the earth. Mm, and there are wells of salvation. What are those wells? How, how, do we get, uh, how do we draw salvation from a well? Uh, turn to the right to Isaiah 51, if you would. Uh, let's pick up at the fourth verse and read a little bit of this. Mm. Listen to me, my people, and give ear to me, O my nation, for law will proceed from me. And I will make my justice rest as a light of the peoples. Now, why would a law, like if the Lord was just going to save everybody, why would you need a law? Why, why would you need to have a law? Go on. My righteousness is near. Hmm. My salvation has gone forth. Oh, it has? Okay, good. And my arms will judge the peoples. Hmm. The, the coastlands will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. Hmm. Now, listen to this mystical statement here. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath. Mm. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke. Oh. The earth will grow old like a garment. Mm. And those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever. And my righteousness will not be abolished. Hmm. So the heavens and the earth was the same as what he says about his law, right? Not a jot or a tittle of the law shall pass away till all is fulfilled. And uh, the heavens and the earth will vanish away, they'll wax old, people will die and so on, but my salvation shall be forever. My righteousness shall not be abolished. What does righteousness have to do? Is it that he's got that cloak of righteousness and he can just put his cloak on you and then you have his righteousness even though you're not righteous? How does that work? Go on. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law. Oh, wait a minute. 
Oh no, that's a little different than a little cloak deal. In whose heart is my law? So we have to have his law in our heart? What if we don't like his law? We have to have his law in our heart and that's how we know righteousness? Isn't that what it said? Mm -hmm. Hmm. You who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Uh-oh. Okay. Seems like we've got to do more than just sort of sidle up to him and have, get that cloak around our shoulder. Mm. Hmm. Okay, go on. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. Hmm. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, huh. and the worm will eat them like wool. Hmm. But my righteousness will be forever. Oh, it will? And my salvation from generation to generation. Hmm. So this, gener this salvation is eternal. Okay, and look at these next verses here. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Hmm. Awake as in the ancient days, like the... Gen oh, sorry. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Are you not the arm that cut Rahab apart and wounded the serpent? Go on. Are you not the one who dried up the sea? Oh. The waters of the great deep that made the depths of the sea a road for the redeemed to cross over? Wait, those so they were redeemed when they crossed over? So it said in Exodus 14 that, that you'll see the salvation of the Lord. And here it says that the Lord will dry up the sea and make a way for the redeemed to pass over. Isn't that the same story? But wait, the children, did they just do nothing? Did that happen instantly to them that they got out of the land of... No, weren't there like the ten plagues and they had to all... They went through all kinds of suffering, right? It was a huge process, a huge deal. Yes? Is there a difference between was redeemed and ransomed, which it says here? Well, uh, redeemed and ransomed really have the same root meaning, which is that they're bought back. So the ransom would be there's a money price on it and the, and the redeemed for the ransom to pass over. Good question. Let's have a look at verse 11 and see what's there. So the ransomed of the Lord shall return hmm. and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Wow, so that sounds like they've been really through a process and they're coming with singing and everlasting joy on their heads. And they'll obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. That's the condition that these redeemed people will be in. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Let's look at Isaiah 61 to the right there. Uh, let's have a look at verse 10. Hmm. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Oh, here it is. He clothed me with the garments of salvation. Go on. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Okay, he covered me with the robe of righteousness. Okay. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Now wait, a little while ago we, we had a Bible study about as a, as a bride uh, prepared for her husband and so on, and we found that that was a whole lot of preparation that you had to do to get ready do you mean there's preparation that we have to go through before we can be covered with that robe of righteousness, before we can be clothed with those garments of salvation? What are those garments? What, what, do, we get, what do we get dressed in? Mm. Okay, let's read that last verse because that's fun. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Mm, that'll be great. And uh, <laughs> let's turn to the right to Jeremiah chapter 3. <laughs> will it not? <laughs> It'll be fabulous. Awesome. Um, Jeremiah 3 verse 23 has an interesting little statement. Truly in vain. Oh, let's have a look at verse 22. Ooh, look at okay. that. Mm. Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. That's right. Indeed, we do come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Didn't Jonah do a little bit of backsliding, you know, a few hundred miles to the west there when he was supposed to go in a different direction? But now, they, now we are come to you. You are the Lord our God. 
Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Mm. So not even the hills or the mountains will, will help us. The, the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Mm. Okay, good. We're just you know loading these into our minds and thinking about them. Uh, let's dip into the New Testament and go all the way through the Gospels out the other side into the epistles. And I want to go back to the Hebrews, if you would. The Hebrews talk a lot about Jesus and what he was doing in this world and so on. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2. That's to the right of the Corinthians. And you go through all the things with a T and then you get to the Hebrews. You go through Philemon and then there's Hebrews. I'm looking for chapter 2, verse 10. This is about Jesus. Okay. Let's read verse 9 as well, 9 and 10. But we see Jesus, who was made a little slow... Oh, sorry. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. That oh, he, he was crowned. Hmm. He was crowned. Hmm. So it seems as though he went through a process and he got a crown as a result of that, that process. Go on. That he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Hmm. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things. Yes, for whom are all things, and by whom. This is sort of the way Swedenborg uses prepositions, isn't it? <laughs> for whom are all things, and by whom are all things. In bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, I liked it all up to those last two words. Mm. Hmm. Who's the captain of our salvation? Must be Jesus. That would be Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And how did he become the, the captain of our salvation? He became perfect, right? And what was it that made him perfect? Uh-oh, mm. sufferings. Oh, Jesus didn't turn into the captain of our salvation in a little quick little minute. He went through sufferings, right? He went through the kind of sufferings that are meant by that, that Red Sea. He went through temptations, bitter experiences in his soul, and that's how he became the captain of our salvation. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Let's turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 5 right there. Uh, verse 9, this is talking about, let's read verse 8, 8 and 9. Though he was a son, this is Jesus again. Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Uh oh, there's the S word again. He was <laughs> he's suffering. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Oh no, wait a minute. There are about eight things wrong with that statement. Mm. Okay, he suffered, and he was made perfect, and he became the author of eternal salvation. Everlasting salvation, right? That righteousness that just even the heavens and the earth will disappear, but not that righteousness and not that salvation unto all those who have faith in him and sidle up to him and let him put their cloak around the shoulder? No. No, it didn't say that. It said unto all those who obey him. There's that thing about the law again. Why, why would we need to obey him? Mm, that's out of keeping with that that idea that you just just believe you know just like maybe maybe it just means obey him because he said get baptized you know but no o obeying him there's more to it than that he was made perfect through these sufferings and that's what brought him to to salvation uh, turn to the right and you'll go through James and get to First Peter and look at chapter one hmm. Oh boy. Okay, let's pick up the sixth verse there in First Peter chapter one. Mm. In this you greatly rejoice, though, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Various trials, and the old King James is even more magnificent wording. In this particular instance, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Mm. Mm. Yes. That the genuineness of your faith 
being much more precious than gold that perishes, mm -hmm. though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes, in the Old King James, there's two references to trial. The trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire. So we get tried the way gold gets tried. The trial of our faith, go on. Uh, and, and glory Jesus at Christ. the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though That's now, the heart again. There's something about the heart, the condition of the heart. Okay. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Hmm. It's like that singing on the shores of the Red Sea. It's like that rejoicing on your on your head forever and all that. Receiving the end of your faith the salvation of your souls. Oh. Wait a minute. The I thought that faith. the moment that you believed, the hour I first believed, says the song, right? I thought the hour you first believed is when you got saved. This is saying salvation is the end of your faith. Even the salvation of your souls. The salvation doesn't come till the end. It doesn't come. You don't get saved until you're on the other side of the Red Sea. You, you've been through that temptation. You come out the other side. Then you're singing. And, and then you see the salvation of the Lord. But before that, not so much. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. The end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. How, how could people teach that salvation comes so, so quickly like that? Boom. Just like a shot. Hmm. Okay. And and oh, one more scripture. I got to turn to the left to get this one. Uh, let's go back through Hebrews, through the things that begin with a T, and you'll get back to Ephesians pretty soon. You go through Philippians, Colossians, all that. Get back to Ephesians, chapter six, verse. Hmm. Paul is talking about all the things you need. Oh. We've got to read from. Uh, uh, it is to the right of Corinthians, and let's pick up the tenth verse in there, shall we? Ephesians chapter, chapter six, six verse, verse ten, and start reading down there. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, and in the power of His might. Not your own might. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not. It's not our own strength that does it. Jonah tried his own strength. It didn't work out so well for him. Be strong in the power of the Lord's might. Go on. Put on the whole armor of God mm. that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Isn't this like that, that shield? Or Go on. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, oh. but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Yes, the wiles of the devil, what Swedenborg might call evil spirits. It's, it's not talking about you can't get along with your brothers and sisters or the people at work or whatever. Our real problem is with these spirits. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these powers that affect us in our minds. Mm -hmm. What do we need to do about that? Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Mm, the whole armor of God. When you're wearing armor, you know, as heavy as that stuff is, it doesn't do to only put it on half of your body. It's just not considered the most optimal way to wear armor, to have half of yourself not protected. Take to yourself the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Okay, tell me about this armor. Come on. A stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Oh, truth. Girded your with truth, okay. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Oh, that sounds like I have to be righteous. I, the, the, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, okay. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Mm. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Okay, faith is good. Faith is great with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Aha, uh -huh. you see, this is a battle between good and evil, and we need to be able to protect ourselves. And take the helmet of salvation. Oh, the helmet. So here it's a helmet. We heard it was a robe or a garment. Here it's a helmet of salvation. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You see, not a single thing in here is literal. It's not talking about literal breastplates. 
or literal, you know, whatever. The shield, all that stuff. The helmet, the shield is faith. The helmet is salvation. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God and so on. We need to take that whole armor of God so that we can stand against evil. Now let me tell you this. Uh, uh, let me ask. Uh, how well would you do... So let's say you want to get armed in order to fight evil. Let's say you want to be well armed in order to have this fight against evil. How far are you going to get in that battle if you are slimy? If you're a slime ball? How far are you going to get in that battle against evil? You put on this nice helmet of salvation, but your head is full of evil. Is that how it works? Mm. Seems to me if you're going to put that helmet on, you've got to be right with God. If you're going to actually put the truth around you, so that you are surrounded by the truth, you have the truth around your waist, right? You have a breastplate of righteousness. You have to have gone through some changes so that you're protected from evil. See, when you think about this cloak of righteousness, if you really think about it, imagine, sorry for this sort of imagery, friends, but, but imagine some sort of reeking devil from the lowest hell. Just, uh, just imagine some devil comes up uh, just disgusting and, and reeking. Swedenborg talks about these kind of evil spirits, some foul heat issues from their bodies, and there's all this gross hair. Some of them don't have faces, or they just have teeth sticking out of the middle of their face, or, or whatever. And then you wrap them in this cloak of righteousness. Right? They're going to be allowed into heaven. Angels won't be able to tell, oh, I thought you were beautiful. You know? No, it, it's, that's not how it works. What the Lord wants to do for us is not just sort of wrap us in this quick little you know, burrito of, of salvation or something. He wants to solve what's on the inside. We haven't been called unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Uh, this is where the Lord wants us to go. It's a difficult process. We have to go get washed in that, you know, in that, in that water. We have to be purified and cleansed in that water. Here's why we're in Ephesians. Look at chapter 4. Here's why. Let's pick up at the 17th verse. We should read this every week. We've been lax. We haven't read it for about a month. <clears throat> this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. And this is Paul, who's considered the poster child for faith alone, and yet listen to what he says. That you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind. Ah, this is about the way that you live your life. It's not talking about whether you have this type of gait or that type of gait. It's talking about how you live. That's your walk, right? You walk the walk. Don't walk the way the Gentiles walk. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Ah, you see, if you really study that passage, you understand that it's the condition of your heart that brings you into enlightenment and understanding. The reason they have ignorance is because their heart is blind. Now, how do their blind? Uh, how do their heart get blind? Who, being past feeling, have given them themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Yes, that's how their heart got out of whack. Was that they lived a really evil life? They did bad things to people and stuff. Go on. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. The truth is in Jesus, and we need to wrap that truth around our waist. Hmm, I wonder what your waist corresponds to that has something to do with living a filthy, lewd, unclean life. Hmm, what would that be? I can't really think. My brain's hurting. Go on. That you put off concerning your former conduct. Your former conduct. This is the way you used to live. You used to live an unclean life. You've got to put off... The old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Yes, that old man is subject to corruption according to the deceitful lust. Go on. And be renewed... Renewed... In the spirit of your mind. Mm. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, wait a minute. There's a very, very potent word in there. I love a lot of the things in this passage, but the word that's leaping out at me right now is the word created. Created. Mm. We have to put on the new man. We have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. You see, what this is teaching is what Jesus is teaching in John chapter 3. We can go look at that in a second if you want. Uh, this is about rebirth. 
Nothing short of rebirth, like being a different person, not being that devil with that foul heat radiating, uh, but becoming a different kind of person because we got recreated because the Lord created us in righteousness and true holiness. We need to be in righteousness, not just wrapped in it like it's around us, but it needs to be in us. We need to be created in it and be in true holiness. And then it gives you a bunch of advice. Put away lying. Don't sin. Don't give place to the devil. Don't steal anymore. Don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Change your ways. It's not about your faith. It's about the fact that we have to live a different life. It's called repentance. That's what we've got to do. Mm, and put off that old man. And we've got to be renewed. Like this thing is not something that happens in 15 minutes. You know, you don't get reborn in 15 minutes. Uh, that, that's, that's false. That's very misleading teaching. Uh, this process of how long does it take you to get out of a bad habit? Uh, you know, I, I've done this thing before where where I just, you know, every so often, you, like you move where the kitchen trash container is. I don't know if you heard me use this example before. You just move where the trash container is. How long does it take you to put the trash in the right place? A month, month and a half or so? It's longer for me. It's a long time. <laughs> if you can't throw the trash in the right place for six weeks, what are you going to do about your evil heart? That's going to take a while to fix that thing. You know, there, we got a long way to go. This is serious work. This is not something about getting wet for 15 minutes and you think you're, in, you're already in heaven with Jesus or something. No, you've got to get right with God. We all do. I do. We all have to get right with God. This is not a simple, quick fix thing. This is a rebirth. The end of your faith is the salvation of your soul. And we'll be lucky to get there. It's a long journey of rebirth of laying these things aside and letting the Lord take us through this new creation. It's an entire creation, just like the creation story in Genesis. It's got seven major phases to it. And the Lord wants to take us through this recreation. It's not a quick fix thing. We're not talking about a quick fix thing. And when you think about life, everything that we really care about and are invested in takes a tremendous amount of effort, doesn't it? Doesn't it take a tremendous amount of effort to be like an effective spouse to someone else? Doesn't it take a tremendous amount of effort to be an effective parent, to do a half-decent job of parenting and everything? These are things that pain us because they're, they're difficult to achieve. You think about people, I was thinking about some young, young person with a skateboard or something, you know, trying and trying and trying and trying and trying to get this, to get this thing right. I really want to be able to do a triple. I've only ever been able to do a double. I'm working on it. I'm out there every day. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. How good do you feel when you get to do a triple? And then when you really learn how to get very good at doing triples? Well, it's fantastic. And imagine the same person saying, oh, yeah, I got saved a few years ago, you know. Well, what was that like? Was that precious to you? Well, I don't know. Well, not really, you know. Uh, because you never worked at it. The things that, that really get integrated into you are the things that you work at. The things that are important are things that we strive at. The, 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 the Lord is a God of striving, of working. And this is about a, about a lifelong effort to lay these things aside. There's a very difficult enemy that, that has our number, that knows where we live and where we sleep at night. And uh, it's going to take a real working. The Lord is working salvation in the midst of the earth. He, he's not just, just plastering it on like a little sticker. Uh, people have the wrong idea as if salvation is just something like, like a stamp. You know, like you have goods being imported into the country and somebody goes around with a stamp and stamps the box. You know, saved, not saved, saved, saved. You know, like you just get stamped or something. That's not what we're talking about. The Lord has something much larger than that in mind that he wants to do with us. Let's look at Ezekiel. Uh, so turn to the Old Testament there in the prophets. Look at Ezekiel chapter 18. If you can find this to the right of Isaiah and uh, Jeremiah. Ezekiel chapter 18 was a whole magnificent chapter that we've studied before in Bible study about the choices that we have to make and repentance and so on, needing to turn our lives in a positive direction. Now the Lord is very merciful. If we move in that direction at all, uh, the Lord will help us and quicken us along the way and so on. Uh, the, the Lord is not standing there in a big, big like, you've got to be perfect for me or something. Uh, but it's also not about just leaving us where we started out. We've got to change 
or we're going to end up in hell like that devil with the foul heat rising off. Uh, look at 18, verse 31 in Ezekiel. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Now listen to that. And it didn't say cast away one or two of the things that you might have done wrong, and don't worry about the rest. It said cast away all the things you've done, didn't it? Mm -hmm. All the transgressions you've committed. And, may, and it doesn't say, I'll, I'll just sort of quick, I'll put a little stamp on you, I'll give you a little gold star, a little sticker, and then you'll be saved. It didn't say that. It said, you make yourself, cast away that stuff you've been doing, and you make yourself a new heart and a new spirit, right? Isn't that what it says? Mm -hmm. Make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Now, salvation is of the Lord. We can't do this without the Lord. The self-help kind of thing is not right either. It's not, you know, we get nowhere. Look at, look at the, the culture. Look at all sorts of things that go on in our world. We've been working that philosophy for a long time. It's not working so well. You know what it says in the 12-step the literature, uh, plainly the, the philosophy of self-sufficiency self is not paying off. It's a bone-crushing juggernaut whose final achievement is ruined. Uh, that's what self-sufficiency is. Uh, that philosophy is not working out really well for, for people. It's great to make a plan and to, you know, and, and to try to better your lives and all that, but not understanding that we need help from the Lord you just end up on Jonah's path. You'll just end up at the bottom of the sea with weeds wrapped around your head and a big fat fish. <laughs> uh, that's where that takes you. We need to cast away all our transgressions and make ourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will we die, O house of Israel? Why, why should we go through that? Uh, look to the left at Isaiah. So that's two books to your left, two, three. Uh, at the very end, Isaiah 65 and 66. See, the new man is created in righteousness and true holiness. And it's a creation of the Lord. He knows how to create us anew. He knows how to make us new. Look at Isaiah 65, verse 17. What does the Lord say there? For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Mm. And the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. In what I create. You see, it fits perfectly with those other passages about how salvation is forever. The righteousness of the Lord is forever. The heavens may pass away. The earth may pass away. But that, that righteousness is forever and that salvation is forever. And look who creates it. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create, says the Lord. Go on. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing. And her people a joy. This is all about. This is all the people who follow the Lord. This is this. The, the Lord creates Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people as a joy. Look at 66, the next chapter, um, verse uh, 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before <coughs> me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. See, this is a deeper way of reading scripture to understand that the new heavens and the new earth that it's talking about is something within us. It's a new inner self and a new outer self. It's a new heart and the new spirit. That's exactly the same thing that it's talking about. The new heavens and the new earth which the Lord is, is going to make and which will persist. So what are, what are we talking about? Oh, we've got to go to the New Testament. Okay, so go to, through the Gospels and the Acts and go into Romans, and then you'll get to the Corinthians. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. This is Paul talking about this subject. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Wow. If anyone is in Christ... Wow, so how do you get in Christ? Is that quick? Do you just say, I believe? Is that, is that all it takes to be in Christ? Oh, no. It says, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Uh, that's what it says in Romans 13, I believe. And uh, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Go on. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Hmm. No. You see, now let me, let me tell you a little bit about this. Okay. 
Um, we are not human. As glorious and gorgeous as our kneecaps are, we're not human because of our kneecaps. We're not human because of our beautiful ears or our lovely eyes or anything like that. We are human because we have something called a will and we have the faculty of understanding or comprehension. Those are the things that make us human. I'm not saying that animals don't have drives and so on, but we have a kind of volition. We have an ability to choose our values, to chart a course in our lives and form intentions and so forth that transcends what animals are able to do. Animals are magnificent and perfect in every other way. But this is the one thing that uh, makes the, the human race worth, worth looking at and thinking about. And uh, every single person on the face of the earth at every given moment is following marching orders that are coming through in their own minds. They don't know where those marching orders are coming from, but I can tell you that every single person is following marching orders at a given moment that are either coming from hell or they're coming from heaven. And those are things that are coming into their minds and into their hearts. Isn't it amazing sometimes you get in a certain mood and you just can't do anything, anything right or someone else you're dealing with, they just do magically the wrong, most destructive, amazing thing possible. You know, they're getting marching orders from hell. And at a, at another mood in another state, you can be getting marching orders for heaven. And things work well, and they go all right. This is what makes us human. And this is the thing that the Lord wants to give us. This helmet of salvation has to do with the condition of our mind and heart. The Lord wants to give us a new heart and a new spirit. That means a new heart a new you know, uh, emotional center, and a new intellectual center. The Lord wants to give us new thoughts and so on. These are the new heavens. He wants to give us a new inner self, a new outer self. Uh, these are the new heavens, the new earth that the Lord wants to give us. These are the things that shape the course of our lives. You may know people, you may have been people, good friends, whose lives were just on a very bad track, just going downhill. And things that seem good to you, impulses that came to you, oh, I think I'll do this, or I think I'll say this to someone, that would be funny, or whatever, and they're just taking you right down into hell. Because the things that are occurring to you in your mind are coming from hell and leading you astray. Uh, you're getting enslaved by the Egyptians. And in order to get free from that, we have to go through temptations and pain. It's difficult to get away from that stuff. The Lord wants to save us. You see, the creation story, the seven stages in Genesis where it goes from darkness, where you start out, the, the first picture in, in Genesis there is just a ball of undifferentiated mud in the dark. Right? That, that's, that's, that's what that is. And what the Lord wants to do is then create dry land and make separations and so forth. Here's the water. Here comes the sun and the moon. And so, you know, things are starting to grow. Then you get living things in the water and in the air, and then you get living things on land. Finally, you get human beings. These are seven stages that the Lord wants to take us through. This is about ourselves. And I could see in my mind's eye today what a magnificent thing the Lord wants to do in our minds. Salvation is not a small thing. And it's not something that lasts for 15 minutes. It is an enormous creative act on the Lord's part that he wants to take us through. That has many, 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 many stages. The Lord will be thrilled if we get to the point where some of our mud recedes and you get some dry <laughs> land, you get a little water. That's great. That's an entirely different world. Being that person, and, and uh, Swedenborg makes it very clear in his writings that we can be walking around as, as adults and functioning and having our goals and dreams and so forth, and we're still just locked in our mud stage in the dark. We just don't have a clue spiritually. We're, we're not at all awake yet. Uh, there are many different stages to this thing. The Lord wants to take us through to the point where that mud ball that was nothing to write home about, a sad little mud ball with the Spirit of the Lord hovering on the face of the water, He wants to turn that into the Garden of Eden. Fruit trees and animals and birds and fish and glory to water flowing forth and blessing all the land, things growing and wisdom and love. He wants to turn each one of us from that mud ball into a Garden of Eden. And you can't do that in 15 minutes. You can't do that in 15 years. It's a long, long project. And actually what the Lord wants to do is to do this with us forever so that to eternity we never be on the egg stage to the limitless things that have yet to come, as Swedenborg says. This is what the Lord wants to take us through. It's a mighty act. It's the lower self, and it comes from hell, to say that this is something that can be accomplished in 15 minutes. It's, it's just absurdity. 
you know, it, it's complete absurdity. It's amazing how impoverished that view is. It's so much richer to understand that the Lord wants to take us through a creation. His salvation is a, is, a, is a creation. He wants to clothe us in that so that we are in that. We are in righteousness and true holiness where the Lord has banished the Egyptians from our minds. We went through painful, painful experiences over decades, but he brought us through to the other side. And now we're able to sing and rejoice because he took care of those enemies. That's the salvation of the Lord. It's a process that he wants to offer us. I'm sure lots of people who got baptized and accepted the Lord as a personal Savior are going through that process, and they're doing fine. I'm not knocking that. But I'm just saying that concept is so wrong to what salvation actually is. It's not a 15-minute deal. Uh, it, it's something that comes from the Lord. It is not true to say that this is something we can just generate for ourselves. It's not of ourselves, as the epistles say, lest we should boast and so on and glory in our own, you know, our own arm brought us our or something. That, that's not true of us. Jesus did that. We don't do that. Uh, but neither is it true, true that salvation is a 15-minute is a deal and then you're done. You just get a sticker, whereas you're working on your triple for years. You know, uh, No, salvation is something we work on for years. We, we seek the Lord. Uh, we want to be brought to that. Salvation is a well of truth. Though going back to the wells of salvation and getting more and more and more abundant truth until we turn into this Garden of Eden, uh, this place of love and 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 imagine what it w would be like, friends. Maybe you know people who are like this in your life. Uh, what would it be like to be a paradise for somebody else? Wouldn't that be nice? To be a Garden of Eden where when people come into your presence, they just feel good because you know the temperature's right in your mind. You know. The temperature's right, and there's plenty of luxuriant vegetation uh, uh, that your mind and your heart are a good place for those people to be. I'm not there, friends, and, and we're, we're, we're not there. We've got a long way to go. As I said last time, I think we're Neanderthals compared to where the Lord wants to take the whole human race. But we can work toward that, and understanding that salvation is a process, and that it is of the Lord, and that in fact, the very process that the Lord went through being perfected, that's what we read, didn't we? His being perfected is what made him the captain of our salvation. That's how he qualified to take us through that process. He knows every detail of that journey. And it's an endless journey. The Lord wants to take us on that journey. There are certain turning points on the journey. Uh, you know, once you get on the other side of the Red Sea and all the Egyptians are dead, you can say, yes, you know, Behold the salvation of the Lord. We've seen the salvation. You've still got to go wandering in the wilderness. You've still got to kill a lot of enemies in, in, in the Holy Land and so on. But uh, there are points at which we can say, yes, we're saved. If, if we're so fortunate as to get to heaven, we can say, yes, we've been saved. But the Lord has a lot of things. He's got a lot of Garden of Eden. He's got an unbelievable plan in mind for each one of us. And he's just longing for us to give him permission. He says, you, you know, make yourselves... A, a, a new heart and a new spirit. He needs our cooperation. I don't know why, uh, good friends, this concept is so difficult. You know, the concepts that people say, either this impoverished idea that we just save ourselves, which is ridiculous and is not working well for the human race, or this impoverished idea that we get saved in 15 minutes and we don't do anything. Nobody seems to be able to just put together the simple idea that it's a covenant. The Lord wants to make an agreement. There's something he's going to do. There's something we need to do. The whole thing is a, is a covenant. It's called the covenant. The old covenant, the new covenant, is the new law that the Lord wants to write in our hearts and our minds. It's just a simple deal. Is that so hard to understand? Hell can't understand it, you know, because they're not in a covenant. Uh, but it's not difficult. It's not rocket science. Uh, the Lord is offering us something, and there's something we need to do to respond. And then we come together, we make this covenant with the Lord, where he wants to bless us and bring us more and more. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Not just those who have faith, those who walk uprightly. That's what we need to do to be in the Lord and to have the Lord in us. And as we go through that process and we realize the Lord went through that process, then we truly know, as Jonah did when he was in the belly of the whale and became thankful for going through that painful experience of temptation that he went through, he became thankful. And he said, salvation is of the Lord. Thank you, friends. Let's close with a prayer.
our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for bowing the heavens and coming down into this world, for suffering what you suffered in this world in order to become perfected, become the captain of our salvation, become the one God of heaven and earth. You are our Savior. We pray for your salvation, Lord. Lead us every day, minute by minute, on that long path of salvation until we reach the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Our Father, who art in heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's keep on repenting, friends, for the usual reasons. <laughs>